systemic massacre. Jihadists kill 132 civilians in Mali. On June 10th, 132 civilians in Mali were murdered by members of uh, Masina Kabita, an extremist rebel, gr rebel group affiliated with Al-Qaeda. The group is led by the Fulani preacher Amadou Kufa. Quote, they have, been, they have also been burning huts, houses, and stealing cattle. It's really a free-for-all, said an official who asked to be remain anonymous for security reasons. Uh, Nuhum Togo, leader of a, part, of a party near the nearby town of Bankas, stated that the clashes with the jihadists broke out during our army operations in the area two weeks ago. The armed extremists then returned on motorcycles as payback. According to him, the attacks happened on June 10th. He also said that the death toll was higher than what was reported by the government. According to the UN, the terrorists... Oh, I was supposed to not say that word. According to the UN, the terrorists and the Malian army are responsible for the attacks against civilians. There has been an Islamist uprising in Mali since 2012. Uh, why, sorry, why is this happening? Why are they doing this to civilians? So people in the area are saying that this is because two weeks before this massacre, the army was trying to take action against the jihadists. And so as retaliation, as payback, they just went after random civilians in nearby villages. Okay, I know Islamists don't be, are not very good with logic, but I still doesn't don't understand how that follows. Like when within their mindset, how is that? How is that revenge against the people? Uh, I I don't understand. Somebody, like I mean, I understand. Are are they um, racially? How is this? How is this affiliated with the people who they want to take revenge of? So the same person who said to the press that previous thing that it was because of like payback from the army. He also is quoted as saying, quote, they arrived and told the people, you are not Muslims in Fulani, then took no. the men away and 100 people went with them, he said, some two kilometers away. Then they systematically shot people. Mm. So, so this is, okay, now I get it. This is an expression of uh, might, right? Like to show that we have, look at our, so basically it's kind of like when the Islamic Republic of Iran goes after civilians because they cannot, they don't have the, power to go at military officials just to show that they can do something right so these people are desperate to show that they're not uh, they are able to do something by by getting by going after the people who can't defend themselves going after the weakest just to exert some authority to show some that they have certain level of authority and power within that region mm -hmm. it's just an it's an expression of force yes i think that's an expression of force with with 132 civilians being massacred as an expression Possibly of like, more. hey, look. Okay. We have we have power. Okay. Um, yeah. wow. These are like these numbers are not being reported. Like okay, so like this is like these numbers are insanely high. Like, how is this not headline news? Oh, I, I mean, like Africa doesn't get that much attention, does it? Like we cover mm -hmm. like the news about one person. Okay, even relative, so even relative to India, like this is getting a lot less news. Even though, like in India, like you have one person dying, over here, just like oh yeah, one hundred and thirty-two. Like oh, okay, what, what, why is this like? I mean, if it was, can you imagine one hundred and thirty-two civilians dying, like just being killed by Islamists in Europe? Like this would be oh my god, this would be in headline news everywhere. 132 like like for example the paris um islamic islamic attack how many people were died there the one that happened at the football stadium yeah yeah i can't remember i feel like it was maybe 15. don't quote me on that but i thought it was 30. somebody can maybe. somebody remind us? i don't remember yeah um but again no, but but remember how the world reacted to that? I mean, justifiably so. 21, somebody's saying 21. Thank you. Okay, but like 132, like, uh, does anybody know about this? Like, I didn't know about this until now. Mm -hmm. 
like nobody gives a crap about African lives. Like not nobody, but not that many people. Like, just compare the reaction to this com to the to the twenty one people who died in France over that Islamic attack. Like, the, it, it's like so different. It's like, oh yeah, one hundred and thirty two civilians. I'm you're another day in Africa, I guess. Like people, that's how mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is. I'm not saying this happens every day in Africa. I'm just saying other people's perception is like, well, of course it's Africa. What do you expect? Yeah. So here's some more information. This is from, I'm quoting from France 24. Um, uh, some areas of the country, especially in the center, have fallen under the control of the jihadists, which vigorously enforce their worldviews. Civilians all also often find themselves caught in the crossfire and clashes between rival armed groups, including those affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. This is crazy. These next two sentences are crazy. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. The number of civilians killed in the attacks attributed to extremist groups has almost doubled since 2020 in the Central Sahel, the a coalition of Western African NGOs said in a report released last Thursday. A UN document published in March said that nearly 600 civilians had been killed in Mali in 2021 in violence blamed mainly on jihadist groups, but also on self-defense militias and armed forces. So since 2020 alone, the number of those ki civilians killed by extremists has doubled. In 2021, it was 600. So, this, so just like get a scale of this problem. And you're right, like there's very little coverage of that. At which point I want to make make a little statement. I Ibn Qayyam is saying, true Armin, few peer few people care about what happens in Africa. D is saying this is a huge tragedy. Witnesses say that it is the largest massacre ever heard of here. And D is also saying thank you, Armin. So wait, there was another comment by D that I wanted to highlight. Shoot. Um basically part of the reason why we're covering this today is because of D, actually. So for those who don't know, D is a fantastic editor that we have here at Atheist Republic. And she is often sending me a lot of news that happens in Africa. And um, she really pushed me to cover this news. And I think it's important because I said to her, I was like, to be honest, oftentimes when it comes to these African stories, I don't know how to cover these very well because I don't have an in-depth knowledge of um, the different uh, parts of the environment that go in, that go on to give rise to this. Some of it seems more instability related and geopolitical less than maybe strictly re religious, which is more of what we cover. And DB said to me, he's like, well, you know, two years ago, we didn't know anything about India, but like, look at the depth and breadth of knowledge that we have now. So that really pushed me and I, I thought about it and I was like, no, you're right. We should cover these stories more because there have been numerous mass killings, like tens and tens and tens of people across different regions of Africa from various insurgency groups that have happened in the recent months that we haven't covered. And so I want to change that. So we're going to start covering a bit more news out of Africa because like Armin said, like, where are people highlighting this? Well, I have to acknowledge it. Like, that's part of my problem too. I was like making an, a decision that was like, well, I don't know how to talk about this, so we're not going to cover it, but I want to change that. So, you know, shouts out to D. Thank you. Thank you to D. Okay. Uh, one thing also that I want to mention is that this also plays into the narrative that we have here, which is the influence of the world liberal order. Okay. Um, and I understand that there are the causes of stuff like this is multifactorial. Okay, there like the, drought is, for example, one reason. Like climate change is also one reason. Okay, which is actually never mind. That's also why you should be supporting people who are uh, fighting climate change. But one of the other factors, again, I'm not trying to say that this is the only factor. One of the other factors is the competition of countries like Russia and China within um, against them becoming major players in Africa and you know Western liberal powers having to compete with that okay because as much as people might hate 
the influence of Western democracies and the, the influence they have over a country like in Africa or other countries. The fact is that their influence is a lot more preferable to the sources of funding and sources of politics that influences that come from out of Russia and China into these places. Okay. One reason, one of the reasons, for example, that you're seeing more political instability in Africa is the increase in coup attempts, uh, because coup attempts used to get you blacklisted in for fund for funding abilities from organizations like the World Bank or IMF, right? So there was a lot of a lot of this was this this incentivizes people for attempting cues because it would cut off access to a lot of funding. But you see when now we have other sources of funding or other sources of political support coming out of China or Russia, then that uh, the this the this how do I say the motivation comes back. OK, because now all of a sudden the funding coming out of like the IMS or World Bank are not the only sources of funding. So you have more motivations to go and attempt political disability because China will still fund you even if you attempt illiberal actions like this. OK, so this is why like this is why we have to be pushing back against illiberal governments. Uh, like the CCP or Russia trying to accept, or Turkey or Iran, okay? So these are the main threats to the liberal order in the world, okay? The I Iran, Iran's trying to exert its power out of its border. So as much as we, for example, complain about India or even a country as extreme as Saudi Arabia, they're not, they're a threat mostly within themselves or maybe close to their region, okay? India j is just, the problem is within India, okay? In, in fact, India might even have a positive influence outside of its borders. It does have a positive influence out of, outside of its borders. Uh, um, Saudi Arabia is within Saudi Arabia and Yemen, okay? Um, but countries like Iran uh, and um, Turkey, uh, Russia, and China, they are major threats to the way everything works like the direction that the world is heading towards creating more peace more stability less violence okay ever since the world world war one and world war two that direction is challenged by these four, four countries okay uh, because they are providing an alternative to liberalism and especially when it comes to china they're backing it up with money okay and in Africa, that's a toxic influence. That's why we have to push, push against it. Does that make sense? Oh no, that makes complete sense. Yeah. I, I also yes. I, people are pointing out in live chat, and it's correct. It's correct to point that. Okay, France's influence in Africa was horrific. Okay, I'm talking about now. Okay. Yes, I know France has a terrible, terrible history in Africa, okay? And that should not be ignored, and it should not be whitewashed, okay? Right now, France's influence in Africa is a positive one, okay? You don't have okay. to... Okay, well, yeah. even contemporary France has some pretty major problems, but you're saying even considering those things, it's still preferable. Yes. I'm talking now. I'm not talking. I'm yes. I understand that even recent history. I'm not talking. I'm not talking ancient history, France. Okay, like I'm not talking about like well, ancient history. I'm not talking about. That. I'm talking very, very even up until very recently. Okay, France's influence in Africa has been horrible. Okay, I'm not trying to excuse any of that. Okay, but right now, right now, France's influence is come is a force for good in Africa, and it's competing. And if it's removed, as it was removed here, okay, in Mali, which is which is like being um, filled, I'm assuming with Russia, right? Oh, you know, Russia has led an extremely successful disinformation campaign in Mali. I know, but it's yeah, exactly. That that has the fact that that is ruining Mali, okay? But and it's happening because France is uh, removal from these areas. You know what I mean? So as much as, again, the, the problem is that France's evil history in Mali, it makes it easy for people to be anti for the removal of France in these regions. But I hope like people, 
the, the thing is that history needs to be used as um, as a way to learn lessons, but not as a way to hold on to grudges, okay? Because calculations change, people's influences change, and you have to deal with new realities on the ground. Anyways, I don't know if people in the left are agreeing or disagreeing with me on this. Do you want to highlight that? Like, I mean, I don't even know what's chaos in the live chat as per usual. <laughs> um, I think the, oh, here's a good comment from Ibn Kayyam. He's saying the literacy rate in Mali is only 30 to 40%. As someone who has interacted with illiterate people, most lack the skills to rationally or to act rationally or consistently with their beliefs and are easily influenced. Um, and I think I would like to leave the final word for D from D because it's a very good comment. D is saying, politics be damned. We need to highlight v religious violence and we are not humanists if we are ignoring Africa. Yeah, yeah I'm, um, I agree. But the, the thing is that politics is influencing the these loss of lives, right? Um, the thing is that these this amount of instability and the rise of Islamism um, in these countries would not happen if these countries were politically more stable, if they had functioning governments. When you don't have the rule of law, right? When you, when you don't have governments that have um, strong armies to create stability, the vacuum that you create is filled in these countries by Islamism. Okay, so it needs we can so the solution is not just to call out Islamism, okay, because you can't expect these vacuums to be able to fill anything else other than Islamism if you if you if you let the vacuum exist if you let the vacuum of power exist. So the main part of this equation to to is to fight not just anti-Islamism but for political stability for a function for functioning governments stable functioning governments and you do that by ally by getting world powers as liberal world powers to have a influence and have trade and relationship with these countries there is no other way we cannot just wish stability upon these countries you need the influence of world powers they need to get involved it's not gonna and again like you were like oh no let them do it themselves even like even kayam just pointed out like look at the level of uh, like if you if you pull out with the level of gullibility and education that exists here, you're opening the door for Islamism, for Russia, for China, for uh, even Iran is playing the Africa game right now. Iran is coming in with Shiism to like as if like the problem was not big enough. Iran is moving into Africa. We're like, hey, let me add my my poison to this mix as well. Shia radicalism is growing in Africa. Significant, like it's really fast. So the vacuum will get filled. If you don't fill it with liberal, you know, a liberal order, it will get filled with all these illiberal ones. You can't be like, oh, Western powers have a bad history, so stay out. Well, yeah, bad history. Now, now we have something worse. And like, for example, you know, if you look at, um, and Russians are being very clever with their propaganda in, in Mali and uh, in other African countries. They're actually being very good at it here. And one thing they do is that they, they know that a lot of these, um, people from these African countries are tired of constantly uh, looking at news, um, especially international uh, news, come just focusing only on the bad stuff. So if you look at Russian news coming out of Africa, like it was competing with France 24 and stuff, they're like, hey, here's some non-radical related news from Africa. And a lot of people are like, well, I appreciate that. Thank you for covering that. You know what I mean? So like, hey, they're giving a positive spin. So the Russian, um, they, you know, they know they're, they're they're very good at what they're doing. And I think like maybe some people who are on the liberal side have to learn like from the Russian outlets to see why are they being more appreciated by more Africans. You have to, and it's complicated. Does that make sense? I could go on about this. <laughs> there was a lot to get into. Um, yeah. But we're certainly going to be like continuing to cover more stories like this moving forward. So whatever you weren't able to say this week, we will find an opportunity again soon enough. Hey guys, if you're a fan of Blasphemy and Sexy Callie, you know, like me, then you need to be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, link in the description below. Because if you subscribe, we will send you a free copy of our Blasphemous Art ebook. And let me tell you, it is the tastiest Blasphemy that you can find anywhere available today.
And we are so generous with our blasphemy that we continue to send you more blasphemy every week. So make sure to subscribe. Link in the description below.